Today we will be discussing the approach to performing an ankle arthrocentesis. Our discussion will include indications, procedural approach, and how to interpret your synovial fluid results. Arguably, the most important part of any procedure is knowing when to perform it. You should consider performing an arthrocentesis, one, to diagnose the cause of atraumatic ankle swelling, specifically if you're evaluating for causes such as a septic joint, a crystallopathy, or hemarthrosis. Two, to identify communication between the joint space and laceration, also known as looking for an open joint. Three, to alleviate pain by evacuating the effusion or the hemarthrosis. Four, to administer a medication within the joint space for pain and inflammation. These latter two indications are less frequently performed in the emergency department. When should you absolutely avoid doing an ankle arthrocentesis? An absolute contraindication includes periarticular infection, such as an overlying cellulitis, that doesn't permit fluid aspiration without penetrating through potentially infected tissue. Two relative contraindications include bacteremia and coagulopathy. If encountered, consider the risk and benefit on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay, now let's talk about how to do this procedure. There are a few different approaches, and it is important to know the anatomy of the ankle for all of these approaches. The patients should have their knee flexed at 90 degrees for any of these approaches. First, palpate the landmarks to identify the joint space and site for aspiration. For the medial approach, identify the depression between the medial malleolus and the anterior tibial tendon. This is the malleolar sulcus. For the anterior medial approach, identify the ankle joint space between the talus and the distal tibia, between the tibialis anterior and the extensor hallucis longus. Now angle your needle 90 degrees to the skin and plantar flex and invert the foot. For the anterior lateral approach, identify the subtalar joint space. Palpate the distal tip of the lateral malleolus and move about one half inch proximal to that space. Also advance the needle perpendicular to the skin here. So the second step of the procedure, after you've palpated your landmarks, is apply antiseptic solution. Allow the skin to dry. Apply a sterile drape here if it's available. The third step of this procedure will include injecting 1% lidocaine with a 25 or 27 gauge needle to create a wheel at the skin, and then infiltrate deeper into the tissue toward the joint space. Remember to aspirate every single time before injecting. The fourth step is to apply plantar flexion and lateral traction to distract the joint and open the joint. So now that your joint space is open, use a 20 gauge needle with a 10 cc syringe and insert the needle 90 degrees to the skin. Apply gentle traction on the plunger while advancing in order to recognize when you've entered the joint space. The fifth step of this procedure, if you haven't gotten any fluid yet, withdraw your needle here, almost to the skin before adjusting your needle. And that way you are going to avoid lacerating the deeper tissues. Okay, great. So now you've readjusted yourself to figure out where you are. Now you're in, great job. Now withdraw as much fluid as possible for all of your diagnostic tests, as well as to alleviate some of the pressure within the joint. If the fluid stops flowing once you've confirmed you are in the space, you can attempt to slightly advance but also rotate your needle by 90 degrees in either direction, as the bevel may be obstructed by tissue or debris. Now that you've done that, your final step, you're going to withdraw your needle and apply a dressing over the puncture site. Great job. Complications of this procedure include bleeding, infection, and nerve or vessel injury. To interpret your fluid analysis, you need to know what to look for. The synovial fluid labs will include cell count, gram stain, crystal analysis, glucose, protein, and culture. Refer to the slide above for further information on how to interpret this analysis. But briefly, for non-inflammatory, such as osteoarthritis, you will see a white blood cell count less than 200 and a negative gram stain. For inflammatory etiologies, you will see a white blood cell count from around 2,000 to 50,000 and less than 25% neutrophil predominance, as well as a negative gram stain. For a hemorrhagic sample, you will see less than 200 white blood cells and a negative gram stain. 
And for septic arthritis, you will see a white blood cell count of over 50,000 with an over 90% neutrophil predominance and a positive gram stain. A few final additional pearls that you should know. 9% of septic joints are ankles. Most common is actually the knee at 45%. Don't be tricked into not performing an arthrocentesis to evaluate for septic joint. Only 58% of patients have fever. Serum leukocytosis is only present in 50 to 60% of patients. Joint pain is also not a prominent feature in patients who are immunosuppressed.